Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. OK, thanks, everyone, for coming along. So we're looking here at helper maidens and evildoers, Greek and Roman witches and modern reception. Um, so just to introduce uh, the topic slightly, although there wasn't a term in ancient Greek or Latin to signify witch in the way that we use the term, certainly there were figures that we now think of having the abilities and the qualities of witches. But there are, however, striking differences in how witches are portrayed in ancient Greek mythology and texts compared to those in ancient Roman texts. The concept of witch was not in existence for Hellenistic texts, and whilst it was more so in Rome, there was an abhorrence for magical acts due to the Twelve Tables legislation. The witch figure moved from being connected to nature, performing magical tasks with herbs, and generally using um, their skills to help humans, so being helper maidens, with useful mythological figures being Medea and Circe, to being more motivated for evil acts and crimes, and particularly casting spells for love or for control in Rome. So first I'll introduce these ancient depictions of witches, and then I'll highlight some modern reception texts that particularly use Medea as their focus, and I'll suggest why this is our modern ancient witch figure. So for ancient Greek witches, or figures dealing with herbs, potions and spells, they called upon divinities to assist them with their work, and the major divinity for magical activity is Hecate. Not only does she have divine lineage, having a titan as a parent, and these are the gods before the Olympian gods, whom Zeus plotted to overthrow um, in power to claim ultimate divine power as his own, but she also had the respect of the Olympians. So despite being connected to the previous gods, she worked within the conventions of both the Olympians and the Titans, and thus she remained her dominion, she retained her dominion rather, even after the Titanomachy. Her sphere of influence covers crossroads, entrances, nighttime, light, magic, herbs, vegetation, ghosts, ghouls, and necromancy, all of the good stuff. Everything that is liminal on a border or helps to gain access across borders. She's also one of the protectors of the oikos, which is ancient Greek for roughly both the house and all of those within the household. It has a much wider meaning than, than we have for our words. Along with Zeus, Hestia, who's the goddess of the hearth, Hermes and Apollo, she's one of those who can keep the household safe. But she might need to let in demons, ghosts or intruders, because she's also concerned with keeping balance. Like most ancient Greek gods, she can't necessarily be relied upon, and she certainly can't be relied upon to always have your best interests as you see them at heart. Hesiod, who along with Homer is one of our oldest ancient Greek authors, wrote about the origins of the gods in his Theogony and how they fit together in the ancient genealogy. From this extract in the hymn to Hecate, we can see how important she was to the Greeks. Although she wasn't one of the Olympian gods, she was honoured by them, and particularly by Zeus, and she uniquely enjoys powers in the areas that are normally divided up between the Olympians, between Zeus, Hades and Poseidon. However, we should take note that she is also a little fickle. She gives glory to those she wants to give glory to, and she will give um, both a good catch of fish, but then also take it away again in the blink of an eye. Yet she's also the nurse to the young, which is definitely a different idea of a nanny god than we might have drawn up. She's reported to have been one of the few who perceived the abduction of Persephone by Hades and helped Demeter to find her daughter. So she is also a helper maiden type to the Olympians. Most of the Greek gods had a coterie of skills, many employing opposites, and Hecate's qualities are both benevolent and punitive, depending on how she feels. We should remember that she is all about balance, and this is important for thinking about how the ancient witches imagine how the ancient Greeks imagined witches. Well, sorry, seven o'clock at night. I should be raring to go. So, whilst magic as a concept is not fully formed until the fifth century BC, we do see in Greek mythology and literary figures mostly women practicing sorcery or popularly believed to possess magical powers. I've mentioned Hecate, Medea and Circe already, but there's also a glimpse of Helen of Troy in the Odyssey using herbs to her advantage, mostly to make her hopeless husband Menelaus forget the sorrows of the Trojan War and presumably tormenting her with his, his excessive crying. So it was a feature of life and usually the lives of women. 
Profits were liminal figures and might also have been considered to cross over into the land of Spooky too, but that is probably a different lecture. Magic in this way is pushed out to the boundaries of religion. It goes hand in hand often, particularly as its practice requires the cooperation of divinities, particularly Hecate. There is the use of herbs and rituals in mystery cults, such as the Eleusinian mysteries, practiced in honour of Demeter, and personal religion practiced by individuals. Modern ideas about magic and witchcraft have it as separate to religion, heretical often in fact, but it just wasn't the case in ancient Greek, it wasn't separated out in this way. The definition of magic can be contested, particularly in antiquity, before it was more pinned down as a concept. Spaeth considers it the socially unsanctioned use of supernatural powers and tools to con control nature and compel both humans and superhuman beings to do one's will, thus separating out from goddesses and female monsters who have no need of magical tools, and from the priestess whose contact with the supernatural is, is sanctioned. However, some of these do overlap. Medea and Circe both have divine lineage. Circe is called a dread goddess, Dinathea, in Homer's Odyssey, and Medea is a priestess of Hecate. These figures of myth are emblematic, Gordon suggests, of magic before magic. What we can also see on this slide is a variety of terms that might be used in the practice of magic and therefore witchcraft. We often see that potions being used, made with herbs, so ancient Greek pharmacon was practiced by witches, often combined with incantations, and we frequently see the need for liminal places, such as graveyards, or more secluded groves to be used in the practice of witchcraft, or even the honouring of Hecate. However, magic is also used in purification. If someone has committed a crime, particularly one of murder, then they're considered polluted until they can be purified and there are limited people who can perform this rite for them. Circe, Medea's aunt, performs this for Medea and Jason after they have killed her brother, when they've taken the Golden Fleece and are escaping the wrath of Medea's father. So this is another example of balance in what can be achieved with magic. So what separates out witches from divinities and monsters is that they frequently need tools to perform their magic. In the Argonautica, the tale of Jason going after the Golden Fleece, Medea is a helper maiden and uses potions for Jason's protection. We see the other side to her skills, however, in the Euripides play of Medea, which sets the action some years later, when they've been rejected from various places to settle, mostly granted due to Medea's magical tasks making them unwelcome. And they have two children, but Jason finds himself with an opportunity to marry a proper Greek princess. Medea is considered a barbarian. She comes from Colchis, which is not Greece, and that's really important in ancient Greek thought. She takes revenge by gifting Jason's new bride a dress and a coronet covered in a potion, a kind of magical napalm, according to Lindsay Watson. And this sets the bride on fire, alongside her father, who literally gets stuck to her when he tries to help her. None of this understandably goes down very well, and Medea secures her need to flee when she kills her children, not by magic, this time by good old-fashioned dagger. If we thought that the gods were going to react badly to this, though, and the Furies, usually invoked in familial homicide, were going to hound her, were entirely mistaken. Her grandfather, Helios, because she is semi-divine, sends a chariot pulled by snakes or dragons for her, and she escapes Corinth and the wrath of Jason after foretelling his ignominious end. Uh, he gets bonked on the head by the mast of the Argo. Potions can also contain parts of wild animals, particularly as we move into Roman sources and reception, but more of that shortly. So the natural world, not just herbs and plants, but everything in it is relevant to the witch. Witches are also associated with animals in other ways. Circe's house is guarded by wolves, lions and bears, and she has the power to transform Odysseus's men into pigs. And this is the extract from the Odyssey in which Circe uses the drugs to transform Odysseus' men. Like most Greek witches, Circe uses relatively simple methods, and little time is spent on the description by the authors. The ancient Greeks don't seem to be particularly interested in the mechanics of how it happens, just that it does. And that might be due to the fact that there is such magic performed in pursuit of divine offerings too. We see the same reticence in the ancient Greek authors, Pindar and Euripides. Medea uses drugs to carry out her will, but there's no description um, given of their source or method of preparation, 
nor of any incantations employed during their preparation. However, Euripides does mention the divinities she names in her incantations, Themis, Artemis, Zeus, Dike, Helios, and then Hecate as she becomes more angry. Hecate, as we have seen, is the big gun that you bring out when you mean business. And this might be reductionist, but it's an idea that's good to think with for mythology and classical literature, that women and men had different spheres that they, they were concerned with. And this explains why we see more women associated with activities that we would term as witchcraft. For the two Greek witches that we've looked at so far, we do see that there is an element of desire involved. Circe desires Odysseus for her bed, Medea lusts after Jason, Although it could be said that Circe's actions in transforming the random sailors showing up at her door before they can think any lustful thoughts about her demonstrates that she has standards. In antiquity, though, as is still sadly often the case, men were not, off, men were not happy with powerful women. In the Odyssey, Hermes warns Odysseus that having sex with Circe might make him weakly and unmanned. Magic performed a central component of religious practice. It has apotropaic features early on to keep away danger. And then in Homer and Hesiod, we see magic being used to give and to receive a more transactional process. It's likely that there was a place in ancient Greek religion for magic, especially personal petitions to the gods. Also, there seems to be a curiosity around being able to employ different words about the same figure to give either positive or pejorative views on their skills. In the ancient Greek tragedy by Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus refers to Tiresias, a famous Theban prophet, as a wizard, Magos, hatchet of plots, but he's ref usually referred to as Mantis, a legitimately endorsed position with the polis, the Greek city. It's a prophet figure. It was not always clear who could say what was part of official religious discourse and what was not. For some, if not most, cultural practices such as divination, the boundary between magic, religion and their conceptions of the marvellous or occult always remained murky. Lindsay C. Watson tells us that the magic of the sorceress is the vehicle for conjuring into being an alternative mode of existence, a world in which all things are notionally possible, untrammeled by rules made by the patriarchy or the mundanity of relationships an alternative mode in which boundaries can be crossed and things can be different. For this final point about inverting the natural order of things, particularly natural elements, we see more of this when we look at the portrayals of Roman witches. So we've not quite moved into Roman witches yet, but what continues between Greece and Rome is the idea of magic as a tool for amatory purposes. Here, however, it well may be a last resort when nothing else has worked. There is, however, a really noticeable difference in how the ancient Greeks considered their witches compared to the Romans. The Greeks think of them as young, often maidens or young women or goddesses and attractive. Circe is described as fair tressed, having a sweet voice. She wears lovely clothes. Medea is described as having golden tresses and donning a beautiful robe, although she does use ointment on her skin. But as someone who uses a nightly moisturizer, I'm not going to judge her for that. Roman witches, on the other hand, are portrayed as old and ugly, and they're also described as more bestial in behaviour. There are quite a few other differences. Greek witches driven to perform magic by sexual attraction to a man whom they then subsequently protect. Circe in Homer, for example, Odysseus says that Circe was yearning for him to be her husband, and even though he doesn't become that, she still provides for him, protects him, and offers him advice for his journey. Medea does the same. She helps Jason because of erotic love, but then does really help him in every step of his quest. And even though this eventually ends badly, as I outlined just before, the initial motive was to help rather than to harm. Greek witches portrayed as either, moral, uh, portrayed as either morally neutral or a mix of good and evil. Roman witches, however, often portrayed as wholly bad, performing magic for selfish or evil purposes. Greek witches also tend to focus on a single outcome, whereas Latin witches often throw in extra evil into their spells. Greek witches operate in mostly mythical contexts. Latin witches are largely in a contemporary framework. And even Latin authors' use of mythological figures usually has a relevance to their contemporary situations and context. 
as we see from both Virgil's Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphoses, taking pains to chart Greek mythology through to the contemporary Roman Empire and political landscape. So to recap, before we begin to look at Roman witches, powers of Greek mythological witches include changing humans into animals, prophecy, they can cure childlessness, they cast the evil eye, they can be a witcher lover, and they can poison an enemy. Because magic was not fully developed as a concept at the time that these mythological figures were being recorded, negative characteristics were not completely developed. Even so, when we do get Roman witches and portrayals of the Greek mythological witches, they're still more negative than the Hellenistic texts, and the Greek witches, though, are still not as frightening as the Roman ones. So there seems to be a basic cultural difference here that scholars have put down to the Roman legislation of the Twelve Tables, which served to fully define and legislate against harmful magic. So in terms of differences in Roman perspectives on witchcraft, they did not view it as part of their religious landscape. From early on, there was a set of laws, these Twelve Tables, which set out broadly the ways in which the state should function and individuals should treat one another and their commitments to society. There were actually 12 gold, uh, bronze tablets, I should say, um, but we, we don't have them in existence now. But they were committed to bronze so that they could establish clearly the guidelines for legal decisions rather than things being more open to interpretation as they had been before. And whilst they're really only available to us in fragments and reports from other ancient texts, we can see from this fragment of Table 8 that it has several interdictions that would trouble ancient Greek witches. Incantations are out. And whilst this might just legislate against evil ones, it might be difficult to prove that your incantation wasn't evil or going to cause harm to another. Enchanting, particularly to do with material goods, administering drugs and nocturnal meetings are all the prohibited are all prohibited, all of the fun. So all of the things that would normally indicate either rituals connected to the divinities of darkness or natural magic are not permitted. So here the Romans establish their stance and in this way, magic and witchcraft must be passed into the realms of those who are considered and can be identified as evil with physical rendering of their wickedness on display once they get to a literary context. So whilst the Greeks most frequently use mythological figures as their witches, I should just mention um, an example of an invented witch in Theocritus's Idol II, which is from roughly the third century BC. It portrays a scene of amatory magic and the witch Simatha calls upon Selene, Artemis, Aphrodite, Hecate and the Morai, the fates. She's attempting a magic rite and incantation to recover the affections of her faithless lover Delphis. However, she's also a young girl and she fulfills the usual portrayal of young maidens, albeit with a more self-serving aspect of magic being practiced here, particularly towards the end of the idyll, when she doubts the efficacy of her magic and suggests that, should it not work, poison would achieve the job of ensuring Delphis takes his romance nowhere else, because basically Delphis would be going nowhere else. Because the Romans wished to portray the witch in different ways to the Greeks, bearing in mind this legislation outlawing magical practice and their different mental conception of who might need to practice such witchcraft, there are more invented witches in Latin poetry and literature, although they are still appealing to recognisable Greek pantheon. So Horace, a Latin writer from the first century BC, has a variety of witches and they're appealing to Artemis, Nox, Hecate and the dread fury to Siphone. Lucan's witch, Erichtho, possibly the most horrible in ancient literature and one which we'll look at in a bit in more detail shortly because she's wonderful, calls upon the Eumenides, Pone, Chaos, Hades, Styx, Elysium, Persephone, Hecate, the Fates and Charon, the uh, ferryman across the Styx. Special mention might also go to Roman portrayals of Medea here too. Although she's not an invented witch, they do expand the focus upon witchcraft and add to the myth. Latin writers have her appeal to Hecate, the Ceres, the Death Spirits, Night, Earth, Moon, Youth, Pluto, Proserpina, Hades and Persephone, and the Furies. Also Chaos, the Danaids, and Dis, Hades. She has a big divine gang at her disposal. To briefly compare how the Romans perceived these Greek mythological witches before we look more closely at the Roman invented witches, it can be useful to see how Medea and Circe are presented in the Latin texts. What's clear from Ovid's portrayal 
here in the Metamorphoses it, is that Romans were really interested in showing how this magic was practiced, what was included and how liminal it made the magical practitioners. Really weird considering they didn't want anybody to do this, um, but they're really fascinated in exactly what, what's done and how it's done. And we've got all sorts of magical ingredients here, not just the herbs that are described in Greek mythology for the rejuvenation of Jason's father. Um, and Medea herself is described as unruly and bordering on madness. She's got dishevelled hair, uh, she's in wild abandon, she's having a great time. Seneca, on the other hand, is focused upon the psychology of his version of Medea. And he is at pains to describe her crimes and to portray her as a wholly evil. His is a Medea incapable of redemption. She's both well practiced in her arts and eager to commit further crimes to advance her cause, whilst recounting her crimes so far, killing her brother, stealing from her father, tricking the daughters of Peleus into killing their father. They thought that they were taking steps to rejuvenate him, um, just as Jason's father had been rejuvenated by Medea's magic. Medea makes sure that she works at a distance here, but she actually facilitates patricide, which is arguably a worse crime than the murder of a non-relative. And to return to Ovid, but this time to Circe, we see how entranced he is with describing the act of magic, which I'm sure, knowing Ovid well as well as you can know a poet from 2000 years ago, um, he wished the reader to equate positively with the creativity of poetry and the magic of making beautiful words and stories. Ovid's always concerned with a metaphor that tells you how fantastic Ovid is. Um, however, in this episode, Circe's fallen in love with Picus, who has rejected her and has been turned into a woodpecker. Glaucus also rejects her, but that time she transforms Scylla, who's the object of his affections. What we do find from the Greeks is that the uh, divinities are never fair. And he shows how Roman witches are often described as having less effective magic than the Greek witches. He has her fail twice in securing the object of her, her affections. So here we have another example of mythological figures being altered to fit contemporary settings and social expectations. And again, this might be a contemporary desire to show witchcraft, not just as something that should not be performed because it's against both the law and social expectations, but also because its efficacy in the desired result is questionable. So the main features of Roman witches might have some crossover with Greek depictions, but they generally differ quite greatly. Whilst Greek witches practice amatory magic, wanting the affections of their beloveds, Roman witches are practicing erotic magic, possibly because in the way that they're described in the texts, they're not attractive. They have pallor. Horace describes Canidia's teeth and Sagana's tall wig as aspects of their physical being that are frightful, whereas Folia has a masculine sex drive. How dare she? They commit foul acts to accompany their spells. In Horace's Epodes 5, they murder a boy to make a love potion. And at the point of death, the boy utters a curse in which he says he'll chase them with the Furies, a curse that should have given the witches here, the four of them working together, much to fear. We're not explicitly told, though, that the boy dies, so we don't know that the curse is actually put in place. But what you definitely didn't want is a dying person to curse you in the ancient world. That would be a very bad thing um, and one which uh, is pretty hard to come back from. And necromancy is also something that's practiced in Roman depictions of witchcraft. That's not uniquely Roman. After all, Odysseus practiced necromancy in the Odyssey when he journeys to Hades to get the advice of Tiresias on his journey home. There he sacrifices an animal to create a pool of blood from which the dead can drink to then be able to speak to him. And, but this is also present in Horace's satires. So Canidia and Sagana pour blood into a pit so that they could call forth from it ghosts from the underworld to give them answers. What we do get in the Roman version is Hades, the underworld, almost coming up to earth rather than the catabasis of the Greeks. Um, Horace describes seeing snakes and underworld, dogs wandering about and the moon blushing red and hiding behind the great tombs. In Roman literature, there's still the link to the natural world that we find with Greek mythological witches. However, Spaeth notices that witches are not just associated with nature, they are identified with it, and sometimes even shown to have control over the natural elements. 
Ovid's Medea addresses the gods and spirits of nature and tells them that they've helped her to run the streams back to their fountain heads, to stir up the calm seas, drive the storms and bring on the clouds and dispel and summon the winds, amongst other control of natural phenomena. So it's not just the elements, but also bestial features that are shown in Roman texts, which is a frequently likened to savage animals or animal-like monsters. Medea is compared in Euripides and Seneca to a bull, a lioness, a tigress, and the monster Scylla and Charybdis. Horace's Canidia, who wears serpents in her hair like Medusa, is also bestial. We also get goddess-like skills in Roman witches in that the writers can appeal to them to reverse the punishing spells and magic that they put in place. So I, I, I'm saying this about goddess-like skills because Horace recounts the myth of the Greek poet Stesichorus, who slighted Helen of Troy, also semi-divine, in his poetry and accused her of infidelity. He was blinded, but once he had repented, he'd written another poem in which he suggests that she was spirited away to Egypt and an Erdelon put in her place in Troy, and therefore she was innocent of infidelity. His sight was restored. Stesichorus attributes this to Helen herself, but Horace attributes it to her brothers Castor and Pollux, who had a temple at Rome. So what Horace then does is he gives this power to Canidia, this almost goddess-like power, because his crime was casting doubt upon Canidia's magic elements and abilities. But it appears that he's been cured of that misapprehension and he tells her that he now believes her and can she please give him back his eyes. So again, there's a focus upon the marginal, the liminal and boundaries. Witches can control that permeable boundary between the living and the dead. And the Romans were reasonably superstitious about keeping their dead honoured and satisfied, primarily so that they stayed dead and didn't want to come back and trouble the living. And they had rites and rituals such as the Paternalia, which was designed to give due honour and prohibited certain other activities such as weddings and official business. Ovid describes in his Fasti, his poem about the calendar, which I promise you is more interesting than it sounds, the consequences of forgetting the dead. In one time of war, Paternalia was not honoured, and the result was our ancestors left their tombs in night silence and wailed. The city streets and broad grassland howl, they say, with a hollow throng of shapeless souls. So it was really important to the Romans that the boundaries were maintained. However, there were some that they might not be able to strengthen, and those are geographical boundaries such as Thessaly, on the fringes of what was considered the civilised world then. So Erichtho from Lucan's Pharsalia, who I've already suggested might be one of the most horrible and therefore interesting witches that we find in the ancient world, um, is from Thessaly, and her dubious magical practices was a marker of her cultural otherness. But she's also demonstrating a lack of respect for prevailing moral standards, and she represents the evils of the contemporary world. So Erichtho, Daniel Ogden says, is introduced to perform a a necromancy, a reanimation for Sextus Pompey, the son of Pompey the Great, to predict the outcome of the civil war against Julius Caesar. As well, and as well as the collection of body parts necessary to magic, the Salian witches are also considered to be able to constrain the gods, therefore using an even greater god in their own spells. So they're considered to be extremely powerful. They've got really some quite mad skills. The poem Pharsalia uses historical context but weaves in poetic fantasy. It was unfinished when Lucan was compelled to commit suicide by the Emperor Nero, who'd also banned the publication of any of his works after they fell out. As an epic, it's considered to be notable for Lucan's decision to avoid divine intervention and downplay supernatural elements, which makes his detailed description of Erichtho even more surprising. So we see here at the start of her spell in which she summons the shade of the corpse and challenges the gods when her will is being delayed, even threatening Hecate with retribution unless she's permitted to perform her magic successfully. I'm not quite sure I'd mess with Hecate in this way, but Eric though seems pretty confident of the outcome. And here is the particularly gory report of the corpse reanimating sufficiently to offer prophecy. There is in the ancient world a trope of the dying or the dead being able to tell the future even back to the Iliad in which Patroclus in his dying breath tells Hector of his imminent demise. So there's a tradition to support this particular kind of action, 
but it would have been considered unwise in ancient Greece, as we saw from the 12 tables, and completely un unlawful in ancient Rome. But in Lucan's poem, he's portraying it as a means to get a prediction of war, and therefore it might be more acceptable, although the petitioner sees that he will lose the war. So being able to, unable to trump ancient witches with any other depiction, although for the sheer number of witches in one text, honourable mention should go to the only extant Latin novel, Apuleius' Metamorphoses, which contains both horror and humour and many transformations. Far too many actually to include in this talk, which is unfortunate, but it could really have just been a talk about all the witches in, in that novel. Do go and read it, it's hilarious. Um, but I'm gonna suggest now that we look at two modern receptions. So the most frequently used ancient witch in modern reception is undoubtedly Medea. There's often a glimpse of Circe too, given their family connection and similarities of powers in Greek mythology. So despite these two women following the Greek pattern of being youthful and attractive, the opposite of what Western popular culture thinks of when you mention witch, they are useful figures because their situations, particularly Medea's, have resonance for the predicaments in which women in exiles can find themselves. I would also suggest that these um, are the figures that modern writers explore as witches because we already have the long-lasting effects of Roman witches in the ways our texts normally portray magic and witchcraft. So Medea and Circe offer something different. Whilst their plights as women may be given greater predominance in the texts, aspects of witchcraft are also there and can be particularly meaningful in cultural contexts. Medea is useful for placing um, the witch in a post-colonial context, and the ways in which her powers are effective can differ a little here. So two reception texts that I'm going to look at are relevant to this and place their emphasis differently. So firstly, The Hungry Woman by Cherry Moraga. This is not a very well-known um, reception. It is a, a play by a Mexican author. And as such, this play combines Medea, most notably the events from her mythological background covered by the Euripides play with Mexican mythology, Aztec mythological figures and names featuring particularly um, of gods to whom there were altars. The chorus are Chuateto for warrior women who, according to Aztec myth, have died in childbirth. In this play, however, Medea has already been exiled to a fictional Phoenix, Arizona, a contested space of crime and liminality for exiled Mexicans, taking her son, Chuck Mool, with her. She's been exiled because Jason found her in flagrante with her lesbian lover, but Jason now wishes to have his nearly 13-year-old son repatriated to him, as his newer, younger wife cannot bear children. It has a slightly trippy structure on the page, moving between the past and present, in which Medea is in a psychiatric hospital, but it becomes clear that she has also, at some time, been pregnant with a daughter who did not survive. Medea is explicitly linked through Chuck Moore's memories of his homeland to La Llorona, whose most common law is associated with the colonial era and relationships between indigenous women and Spanish conquistadors. And this common law of this, um, of this Gothic figure suggests that she murdered her own children by a wealthy Spaniard after he abandoned her. So the correlations to the Medea myth, at least the one that Euripides popularized, because she doesn't kill her children in most of the other most of the other mythological narratives about her, are clear. There's limited witchcraft in this play. It's mostly about Medea wanting to protect Chak Mool, her not really seeming to know what she wants relationship-wise, and her stunning everybody with her Mexican beauty. But she does kill Chak Mool through herbs, Pharmacon, when he shows signs of being Jason's son. He wants to return home to his birthright and generally turning into a man or maybe just turning into your average 13 year old teenager. Chak Mool returns the favour at the end of the play when he visits her in the asylum, sprinkling the herbs that she sprinkled into his soup into her water. He avows, though, to her that he's not a ghost. So the play ends with us not really knowing if her witchy powers are effective or not. It's quite unclear. But certainly she doesn't have the victorious ending of the Euripides version. It could be interpreted that in this version, her witchcraft is her beauty. And what we get is her, its destructive power, although it's most destructive to Medea herself. Savage, Savage Beasts by Rani Selvaraja 
is uh, Medea moved to India. She's a Bengali princess romanced by the heir of the East India Company, who asserts that he wants to betray its owner, his uncle, and have her as his wife, albeit without any kind of ceremony, never mind a legally binding one. Mina, as she's called in this text, rebels against her cruel and loving father. Her mother has died, her elder brother is also a cruel bully, and she's told that um, by her father that he always knew you would take after your witch of an aunt. Here it's just an insult, perhaps, but again, Powers and, Pharma Powers and Pharmacon play an important part in the story, as does Mina's self-awareness in places. She reflects on her family's potential defeat and loss of Bengal with, she considered pointing out that once her family had been the foreign invaders, but thought better of it. Mina's aunt, Kiran, who left India for Ceylon after her sister's death, left Mina a miraculous healing balm, which is especially useful because Mina's father's cruelty also runs to violence. Kiran is described as formidable and taught Mina that like a woman, plants have more to offer than their beauty. And she taught Mina how to use the plants growing in her mother's garden, which she utilises to drug palace guards and incapacitate them as they're about to fight and probably kill James, the Jason figure in the text, and she also sets the guards against each other to facilitate their escape. Uh, she does that with drugs as well, and it is a bloodbath. There were certain arts that Mina's aunt had trusted her with, how to make others joyful, lacrimose, paranoid, full of rage. However, the killing of Mina's cruel brother is pure violence, explained by the third person omniscient narrator as a trauma response because, because he had tortured her for years, made her spend every moment of her life in his presence on edge, terrified of what might happen. Whilst this does nothing to endear her to the ship's crew as they're escaping, because she does hack him to death with an axe on the deck of the ship, neither does the suggestion that they stop at Ceylon to see her aunt to, to basically fix Jason, who's been hurt. Um, and one of the crew suggests that uh, Kiran might be some kind of witch doctor. Mina corrects as very knowledgeable about medicine. Um, and Kiran, her aunt, the Circe figure, um, does excel at natural medicine, and she also has a leopard as both a pet and protection. She takes Crazy Cat Lady to a new level. Mina was awestruck watching her aunt work. She had spent years practicing what her aunt had taught her, many hours chanting the names and purposes of various plants and herbs, cumin to ease digestion, turmeric for heart, go to Carla helps keep the mind healthy, but it also reduces swellings. Mina had learnt them all. But for her aunt, decades to turn practice into instinct and a moment's look at James's wounds was enough for her to realise what she needed to do. So Kiran combines herbs with whispered words, which cause the air to stir and electrify. So here we have the pharmacon, the spell casting and the effect upon the elements that's part of the ancient portrayal of witches. She's also portrayed as a feminist reception of Circe in refusing to offer her home to the sailors because no good comes from a band of men. We glimpse the experience of Circe from the Odyssey, especially when she feeds wild boar with the names of the previous Dutch occupiers of her house. Just the names or maybe the Dutch occupiers, um, inverting it to make Circe, Kiran, the invading force. So even though a recipient of Kiran's healing powers, James calls it witchcraft and definitely in a pejorative way. But Kiran talks to Mina about the reciprocal relationship with the land, which allows her to control the plants and replicates the respect given to nature that we find in the ancient Greek portrayal of witches. She also, however, however teaches Mina about the dark arts that you can make from plants. So towards the denouement of the novel, when James announces his intention to marry his uncle's daughter, the action unfolds in a very similar way to Euripides' Medea. Mina poisons the dress and tiara that she gets her son to take to the young woman, which kills her and her father. She's already arranged a carriage and horses for her departure, and she drugs her son. All believe that he is dead because she takes him out wrapped up in a blanket. Um, but when on the sea, it becomes apparent that she's used a drug that she hopes is just feigning death, avoiding the uncomfortable matricide that a text audience has such a difficult time coming to terms with. So in conclusion, because I think I've probably waffled at you enough about ancient witches and their modern receptions, whilst the term witch wasn't in use in ancient Greek or Hellenistic times, there was certainly behaviour that crosses over with that which we would ascribe to witchcraft and magic. 
although the boundaries between this being either state sanctioned in terms of religion or just generally pious and in line with what divinities can give and receive are somewhat murky. And the practitioners of this magic are not assumed to be intrinsically evil or to have any physical markings that render them identifiable as practitioners. Mythological witches are young, attractive women, often performing magic broadly in helpful circumstances. This changes when we get to Rome and the prohibition of magic through the Twelve Tables legislation. Witchcraft tends to take on an evil aspect. Witches are old, ugly, they have physical deformities or features which single them out as being different, and they're performing magic to do harm. Whereas the Greek witches are considered a positive feature of boundaries and liminality, this is considered negative by the Romans. Because we in modern times have a hangover, if you will, from the Roman portrayals of witches, we don't need to receive the ancient Roman witches. Instead, we recuperate the Greek ones, only now their magic is much less important to their portrayal. More important is exploring their femininity, their outsiderness, their identity as defined by others, particularly in colonial and post-colonial contexts. Where the use of herbs and potions is recognised and placed in the text, it adds complexity to the character. In this way, hopefully we can recognise that, that the portrayal of witches can be as broad, diverse and interesting as those in the ancient world. Thank you. <laughs>